They called him the Hangman. Reinhard Heydrich. This notorious Nazi became one of the most hated men in all of occupied Europe. He was the real mastermind behind the final solution. The man who created the blueprint for the Holocaust, the mass murder of six million Jews. He would then rule occupied Czechoslovakia with a rod of iron, sending thousands of Czechs to their deaths. Heydrich's ambition knew no bounds. He even nursed aspirations of replacing Adolf Hitler. He thought he was untouchable. But in London, a top secret hit squad had different ideas. They targeted Heydrich for execution. A crack team of Czech assassins recruited from Churchill's secret army was infiltrated into occupied Europe. Their mission was simple to go in and kill Reinhard Heydrich. In the end, the Nazi hunters would get their man. But the cost was terrible. Hundreds died, murdered in revenge by German soldiers. It begged one uncomfortable question. Was this Nazi hunt worth it? May 1942, a spring day in the ancient city of Prague. Reinhard Heydrich, brutal ruler of the occupied part of what was once Czechoslovakia, left his country home outside the city. His powerful chauffeur-driven Mercedes 320 headed into Prague. Heydrich had a busy schedule ahead of him. He was due to fly to Berlin to meet with Hitler himself. A possible promotion was on the cards. It was just after 10 a.m. and he was running about an hour late. He would have to hurry. The locals kept their distance. It was well known that getting too close to Reinhard Heydrich was dangerous. But a few miles further along his route was a hit squad. Four assassins were lying in wait for Reinhard Heydrich. They were Nazi hunters, Czech soldiers trained by the British intelligence service. Their mission was to kill the hangman. They knew it was unlikely they would return alive. As it navigated the streets of Prague, the Mercedes had to slow down. A chain of events was about to be set in motion that would have massive repercussions and lead to one of the most notorious atrocities of the war. The Mercedes changed gear and prepared to negotiate a sharp bend. Reinhard Heydrich was seconds away from assassination. Reinhard Heydrich's path to evil began early. In the town of Hall, near Leipzig. His father, 
Bruno was a musician, but he had also been accused of being a Jew. He was the target of racist slurs. This bullying upset the young Heydrich. It was the start of an early obsession with race. In the years after World War I, Germany had descended into chaos. The country was tearing itself apart. There was open fighting on the streets. Poverty and despair were rife. Heydrich found himself drawn to the right-wing politics of the Freikorps, a patriotic militia which waged open war on socialists and communists. In search of order, he joined the Navy in 1922. The strict military discipline now gave him direction. As a cadet on the training cruiser Berlin, Heydrich met Wilhelm Canaris, the man who would change his life forever. Canaris introduced the young officer to the murky world of naval intelligence. Heydrich learned valuable skills that would serve him well, and the two became friends and allies. Heydrich rose quickly and did well in the Navy, but his reputation for womanizing would be his undoing. In May 1931, he was dismissed for conduct unbecoming of an officer after making marriage proposals to two different women. One of them had been the daughter of a senior figure in the Navy. Heydrich was out of work in a country with no jobs. But then he came across Adolf Hitler. The Nazi party seemed to offer Heydrich a chance to start again. In June 1931, he joined the National Socialists and became party member number 544916. Soon, an old acquaintance arranged an appointment for Heydrich with Heinrich Himmler. Himmler was one of the Nazis' most powerful figures. He was chief of the SS, the Nazi party paramilitaries who served as the bodyguard to Adolf Hitler. Himmler was instantly impressed by Heydrich. His expertise in the world of espionage was something the SS could use. The 26-year-old former naval intelligence officer, only four years Himmler's junior, was hired on the spot. By the early 1930s, the SS ranks had swelled to 50,000 men. Heydrich's role within the SS soon grew, thanks to a major promotion. He was put in charge of the SD, the security service of the SS. It was the Nazi party's first dedicated intelligence department, and it immediately set to work digging up information which could be used for blackmail and intimidation. A vast archive of cross-referenced index cards listing a host of enemies of the Nazi party was developed by Heydrich for the sole purpose of terror. The SD would soon become very useful. January 1933, Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. Now the Nazis had power, 
Hydric's card index system was used to target their enemies. Many would be beaten, others imprisoned, and some would be murdered. In 1934, Heydrich took over the Gestapo, the state secret police. He now wielded immense power. And soon he befriended the most important man of them all, Adolf Hitler. Heydrich regularly went to the Berghof, Hitler's private home in the Obersalzburg. There, he joined SS leader Himmler as part of the Führer's innermost circle. The social get-togethers included all the Nazi hierarchy and their families. Hitler's guest list included propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop and his architect, Albert Speer. Heydrich was now one of Hitler's favorites. He was ready for a role in the one policy that would make the Nazis infamous. The 9th of November 1938 was a date that would go down in history. Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, saw the ransacking of hundreds of Jewish-owned shops and synagogues. It signaled the beginning of a dark new era. Under Heydrich's orders, 30,000 Jews were arrested. They were sent to concentration camps, massive purpose-built prisons where enemies of the state could be held. The former Navy officer had graduated from political thug to the bureaucrat of racial hatred. At Hitler's request, the SS devised a more systematic approach to the Jewish problem. Heydrich was appointed as head of the Jewish section of the security service. At this stage, his job was simply to force the Jews out of Germany. Heydrich established the Reich Central Office for Jewish Emigration in Berlin. His accomplice was Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann was a young SS officer who drew up a number of proposals to make Germany Jew-free, including a plan to resettle the Jews on the island of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. But mostly the method they favored was forced emigration to other countries. The tactics they used, intimidation and violence. But Hitler's territorial ambitions would soon enable the Nazis to take a more sinister path towards the Jews. September 1939. Europe was plunged into war. For Reinhard Heydrich, with his devil-may-care attitude and love of action, the war seemed to offer a world of exciting possibilities. It was far more appealing than any bureaucratic duties for the time being. Despite being older than his fellow recruits, he retrained as a fighter pilot in 1940. He was keen to show that the SS were elite warriors, not just political soldiers. Within months, he was at the controls of a Messerschmitt 110, flying nearly a hundred combat missions over Norway. In 
1941, as Hitler's Operation Barbarossa tore into Russia, he took to the skies again, against the orders of his superior Heinrich Himmler. Flying a Messerschmitt 109, he fought over southern Russia. For this, Heydrich was awarded several medals. But then he came unstuck. He was shot down behind enemy lines. He managed to get back to German positions, but would never be allowed to fly again. Instead, he returned to officialdom and one of the most pressing problems facing the Nazis, the Jews. As Hitler's armies captured vast swathes of Eastern Europe, the sheer number of Jews in their hands presented a serious problem. What to do with them? Forced immigration was clearly out of the question. Instead, the Nazis settled on murder. SS action squads or Einsatzgruppen followed Hitler's armies. First, they shot thousands of Jews in Poland. But all this murder posed a problem, even for the hardened Einsatzgruppen. Killing in such large numbers took its toll on the soldiers' morale. A new approach, something different, more clinical, was required. And so it was that Heydrich was asked to devise a final solution to the Jewish question. In January 1942, in the Berlin suburb of Wannsee, Heydrich chaired a secret conference to work out the details of the final solution. Heydrich suggested wholesale industrialized murder. All European Jews should be exterminated in gas chambers. A whole new range of specialist extermination camps was to be created. They were built in Poland. Among them was Treblinka, Sobibor, Belzec, Majdanek, and Auschwitz-Birkenau. Up to 12,000 could be killed within hours of arriving at a camp. The man Heydrich chose to orchestrate the transportation of the death camp's human cargo was his old comrade, Adolf Eichmann. Russian prisoners of war, political prisoners and gypsies were also shipped to the camps. At the very top of this killing machine was Reinhard Heydrich. He had the blood of six million Jews on his hands. Heydrich proved so good at his job that he was rewarded. In September 1941, he was made acting Reich's protector of Bohemia Moravia, what was once part of Czechoslovakia, captured by the Nazis two years earlier. Now Bohemia Moravia became Heydrich's personal fiefdom. Heydrich immediately set about using on the Czechs the tactics he had perfected in the SD and Gestapo. But of course what he didn't know was that meanwhile, far away, others were plotting to kill him. The new government for Czechoslovakia has been organized in Britain. Under the leadership of Dr. Benesch, who greeted the new members, these early victims of German aggression will work to restore freedom to their country and their people. From 1940, London was the home of the Czech government in exile. 
led by Eduard Benesch, the nation's president who had been forced out by the Nazis. These exiles were eager to fight on. Czechs who had escaped west fought on in the British armed forces from early on in the war. This was the first occasion on which the army of our allies from Czechoslovakia has received a visit from the Premier. With Dr. Benesch, their president, he inspected them and took the salute at the March Pass. By 1941, the first Czechoslovak mixed brigade was some 3,300 strong. They trained for the moment when they could return to liberate the homeland. In the meantime, volunteers were seconded to fight the enemy in a less conventional manner. In July 1940, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill formed a shadowy agency, SOE, or the Special Operations Executive. SOE's goal was to set Europe ablaze by carrying out sabotage operations and supporting resistance movements. It became known as Churchill's secret army. Agents were parachuted into enemy-held countries to fight the German occupation from within. Communication links were set up with London, intelligence was gathered, and tons of arms were dropped behind enemy lines. The SOE boasted an arsenal of specialist weapons, from guns with silencers, to incendiary briefcases and cigarettes, itching powder, and even exploding rats. By far the most effective was the Sten gun, a 9mm submachine gun. The Sten was robust and could be easily broken down and transported. It would become the SOE's weapon of choice. In the late summer of 1941, Benesch became increasingly alarmed about what Heydrich was doing to his country. Within days of his installation in Prague, thousands of Czechs were arrested, resistance networks crushed. For most of Heydrich's prisoners, the future was bleak. They faced interrogation at the hands of the Gestapo. Immediate execution, or a cattle car to a concentration camp at Mauthausen. Certain death. The same merciless treatment was meted out to the Czech Jews. First, Heydrich ordered all of them to wear the yellow star of David. Then he established a huge ghetto in the town of Theresienstadt. It housed more than 140,000 Jews in squalor. At the beginning of October 1941, Heydrich and his old friend Adolf Eichmann chaired a conference on the Czech Jewish problem. Heydrich proposed 90,000 Jews in the Protectorate should be shipped away and murdered. Eichmann said it wouldn't be a problem. He noted, using a time-tested method, each Jew may take a non-lockable piece of luggage with up to 50 kilograms of personal belongings, and to make our task easier, food for two weeks. To ensure that the rest of the Czech population didn't object, Heydrich bought their silence with improved rations and a campaign against black marketeers. Hitler's propaganda chief, Joseph Goebbels, noted Heydrich plays cat and mouse with the Czechs and they swallow everything that he places before them.
Back in London, Banesh had to stop this situation. So he turned to the SOE. Benesh and his cabinet drew up a number of measures, including the assassination of prominent Czech collaborators. But a more high-profile target was preferred. There were two obvious options. The first, Karl Hermann Frank, was the Secretary of State and Police Chief in the occupied Czech lands. Frank had repressed student demonstrations in 1939 and executed scores of Czech nationalists and intellectuals. The second potential target was his superior, Reinhard Heydrich himself. In the end, they aimed high. They targeted Reinhard Heydrich. Assassination was a departure for the SOE. Only on one other occasion had they contemplated it against the Führer himself. Operation Foxley was the plan to insert a small team to shoot Adolf Hitler with a sniper rifle as he took his daily walk around his mountain retreat in the Ober Salzburg. But it was hard to pull off. The Führer was too well guarded. Eventually it was canceled. It was decided that keeping Hitler alive would actually shorten the war. In Reinhard Heydrich's case, the Czech government in exile felt an attack was possible even though there would be savage reprisals. As Heydrich reveled in his status as a top Nazi, he still had no idea that a team was getting ready to kill him. Ten men, all young bachelors, were selected from the Czech mixed brigade for SOE training. It included a physical fitness program, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and sharp shooting. From the ten men, two were selected for the mission to kill Heydrich. Jan Kubisch, a former army sergeant from Moravia, who had fled the Nazis in 1939, and Karol Svoboda, who had served in the French Foreign Legion. But Svoboda was injured in training and was replaced by Josef Gabčík, a former comrade from the Foreign Legion. The mission codename was Anthropoid. By November 1941, everything was in place for the team's mission. Kubisch and Gabčík were ready to go. But the launching of Operation Anthropoid was delayed by bad weather. Operations room. Oh, good. Just a minute. Finally, on the night of the 28th of December 1941, seven Czech agents boarded a Halifax bomber. With Kubisch and Gabčík, there were five other agents part of a task force codenamed Silver. The Silver operative's job was to set up radio and intelligence gathering networks to improve communication with London. The bomber's passengers were part of a wave of 17 specially trained agents to be dropped into the region over the next two months to revitalize the resistance movement crushed by Heydrich. The bomber headed for the city of Pilsen, some 60 miles west of Prague. Despite being dropped off target to the east of Prague, the anthropoid team landed safely and soon found shelter in a cave. Kubisch and Gabčík then made contact with the resistance and disappeared into Prague. 
they now had to choose the time, place, and manner of Heydrich's death. The planning took five months. The first idea was to attack the Reich's protector's personal train. They identified a branch line with enough cover for an attack. The chosen method? They would fire an anti-tank weapon at his carriage. But it was hard to be certain that they could hit the right one. They had to think again. The team then thought about derailing his train, but a dry run on a troop carrier failed to inflict major casualties. They had to go back to the drawing board. Meanwhile, Kubish and Gabchik's target, Heydrich, had come up with yet another sinister plan. Under the cover of a program to eradicate tuberculosis, all checks were to be classified by nationality and race. Heydrich wanted to establish which sections of the population were suitable for Germanization. Anyone who was deemed physically unfit would be shipped off to camps and killed. Now with the onset of spring in 1942, Kubish and Gabchik were closer to finding a better method to kill their target. The two assassins had observed Heydrich's movements and studied his daily routine. They had hatched a plan. But their mission was proving contentious. Other agents feared reprisals and a massive security clampdown. Communication with London flew back and forth. Messages urged Anthropoid's cancellation, but the warnings fell on deaf ears. The Czech government in exile had made up its mind. On May the 20th, Benish gave the green light. Meanwhile, Heinrich Himmler had visited Reinhard Heydrich in Prague. He was alarmed by his deputy's overconfidence. He urged that, at the very least, his car should be armoured. But Heydrich did nothing. He believed the Czechs were well in hand, and he was eager to show it. His bravado would soon cost him dear. His assassins were ready to strike. Their plan, though complex, offered the best chance of success. Heydrich lived in a village 15 miles north of Prague. Each day he commuted by chauffeur-driven car to Haradchani Castle, the ancient seat of power in Prague. It was during this daily car journey that he was most at risk. The team identified the best spot for an ambush a hairpin bend at the bottom of the hill where his Mercedes limousine would have to slow down. According to the plan, one man was posted at the top of the hill. He would signal the approach of the Mercedes. The second man would cross the road further down the descent to slow the Mercedes to a crawl. At the bottom of the hill, near a tram stop, were the two assassins. Their weapons, a 9mm Sten submachine gun concealed under a raincoat. The other, a modified Type 73 hand grenade, carried in a briefcase. It's got an instantaneous fuse, so you've got to aim straight and hit the mark. On the morning of the 27th of May, the two assassins, Kabchik and Kubish, left their safe houses and headed into Prague. Two other men were also making their way to the rendezvous to join them. Josef Balchik was to be the signaller on the hill. He had parachuted in with them on the silver mission five months earlier. He had joined forces with Kubish and Gabchik while on the run from the Gestapo. The final man, Adolf Opalka, 
was an SOE officer who had joined them a few weeks before. He would slow the descent of Heydrich's car before the hairpin bend. At the ambush point in the Lipin district of Prague, the team took up their positions. Kapchik readied his Sten gun. Kubish primed his grenade. All they had to do was wait. With every second that passed, the risk of them being noticed loitering grew. Finally, just after 10.30, Balchik signaled the Mercedes was coming. Seconds later, a Palka set off across the road. A tram rounded the corner. Kapchik stepped out, but his Sten jammed. Instead of accelerating away, Heydrich ordered his driver to slow. Kubish pulled the grenade from his briefcase. Heydrich was hit by shrapnel. Even so, he decided to take them on. Kubish made his getaway. Gabchik, however, was pursued by Heydrich's driver. Reinhard Heydrich had been badly injured. He was taken to the nearby Bolovka Hospital. The grenade had driven fragments of metal, seat cover, and shreds of his own uniform into his vital organs. His life now hung in the balance. News of the attack was immediately wired across Germany. When Himmler heard it at his field headquarters, he reportedly burst into tears. Five days later, Himmler visited his wounded colleague in hospital. Initially, it looked like Heydrich might pull through, but his wounds had become infected. Without access to penicillin, septicemia, blood poisoning, had set in. Reinhard Heydrich died on the 4th of June, 1942, eight days after the attack. Heydrich's coffin was paraded through Prague on its way to Berlin. Despite his past record, Many Czechs turned out in massive numbers to pay their solemn respects. In Berlin, his coffin lay in state, draped with a swastika flag. The SS Guard of Honor was led by Heinrich Himmler, He also delivered the eulogy for his deputy. The Führer himself paid tribute to the dead SS man's sons. But even as he did so, there was speculation that Himmler had played a small role in Heydrich's death. Rumors circulated that Heinrich Himmler had deliberately allowed him to die of his wounds because he saw Heydrich as a threat. It was alleged that Himmler's doctor, who had operated on Heydrich in Prague, had been told to make sure that he didn't recover. Whatever the truth, 
the outcome was the same. Heydrich was gone, and the hunt for his killers had begun. The man appointed to chase down the four agents was Nazi Secretary of State Karl Hermann Frank, the man who the Czech government in exile had elected not to kill. A one million marks reward was offered. Anyone helping the Czech agents was to be shot. A radio message was broadcast to the city declaring martial law, a curfew, and the nation to be in a state of siege. A manhunt was underway. Three army battalions were trucked into Prague. 4,500 soldiers and Gestapo scanned the city and countryside. The German police undertook a forensic study of the crime scene. A detailed report was prepared. And any evidence gathered was carefully catalogued. The assassins had left plenty behind, and the Gestapo quickly used it to their advantage. The Nazi hunters became the hunted. Newsreels were shown appealing for information. Pozor, pozor. Kdo zná majitele předmětů, které nyní podrobně ukážeme? The films asked for leads from the Czech population. They showed Gabčík's bicycle, his raincoat, the jammed Sten gun and a pistol, even the type of grenade thrown by the assassins. While their two briefcases contained clues pointing squarely to Czech dissidents. Then, a chain of events was set in motion that would call the whole operation into question. The small mining village of Lidice was selected as a target for the Nazis' revenge. Hitler gave orders for the community to be erased. over 16 were lined up and shot. 199 men were killed. The women were rounded up and transported to Ravensbrück concentration camp to a certain death. Nearly all children were removed to another concentration camp at Gandais now. The entire village was gone. Lidice would become one of the most notorious symbols of Nazi brutality. Meanwhile in Prague, the assassins were hiding in St. Cyril Church along with other agents. But eventually the ransom on offer proved too much. They were betrayed by one of their own number. Karol Kurder a fellow agent gave the Germans a lead. By 4.30 on the morning of the 18th of June, the church had been surrounded. For two hours, Kubisch, Apalka and a third man, Yaroslav Schwarz, fought off the SS troops who had orders to take them alive. At the end of the battle, their corpses were dragged into the street. The four remaining SOE men took refuge in the crypt. The Prague Fire Brigade was summoned to flood them out. In the end, the Czech agents used their last bullets on themselves. The Nazi hunters had chosen death over capture. They had got their man. Heydrich, the sinister living card index and mass murderer, was dead. But in the end, did it make any difference? Himmler 
had no more trouble with the Czechs. Nazi propaganda newsreels continue to represent the assassination as an outrage, the Czech nation still united in grief. In July 1942, Yaroslav Krejci, the Nazi-appointed prime minister, finally revoked martial law and normality slowly returned to Prague. SOE and its agents would subsequently play only a minor role in the country's eventual liberation. The Germans turn artillery on the city. In the bitter six-day fight, over 2,000 are killed. In the end, the Nazi regime finally crumbled when the Russians came in. Prague is liberated. German rule is wiped out. Troops of the Red Army enter the city. With them are units of the 1st Czechoslovak Army, which fought all the way from the Volga. In May 1945, the people of Prague rose up in revolt against the Nazis to welcome the advancing Red Army. Dr. Edward Benesch, president of Czechoslovakia, returns to his native land. The people of Prague welcome the distinguished statesman who has long fought for his nation's freedom. After seven years of tyranny, Czechoslovakia is once again its own master. However, when the dust finally settled, serious questions were asked about this Nazi hunt. The traitor Karol Kurda was later found tried and executed. The killers of Lidice were hunted down. 16 members of the Gestapo death squads who had destroyed the village were tried. Their superior, Karl Hermann Frank, was sentenced to death and hanged in 1946. But to many, it was scant consolation. Lidice stands as a permanent reminder of the true price of the assassination. In all, some 5,000 Czechs were executed in revenge for Heydrich's death. No one could deny Reinhard Heydrich had got what he richly deserved, but even now, it has led many to wonder, was this Nazi hunt worth it?